I'm going to make some observations and uh, hopefully spark conversations. The whole, the whole point of this is hopefully a bit more thought-provoking rather than the, the technical detail that Adam went through with us. So again, thank you for that. Um, so we'll see how this goes. It's, it's definitely a Kevin Roberts experiment type thing as far as I'm concerned. Um, I'm Lewis Crawford. Um, I do data and AI. That's all you need to know. Um, so kicking straight into it with maybe a bit of a, a distractor. Okay, what I learned about AI from Taylor Swift. So, maybe, <laughs> maybe. So I'm, I'm finding LinkedIn um, is full of content like this. It's either AI generated, um, full of vacuous content, clickbait, or alternatively, if it is actually humans doing it, then it's virtue signaling and uh, humble bragging and things. So. I'm going to have a go at this anyway, and I'll let you decide which, which category that kind of falls into. So my other social feeds are either full of cray-cray for Tay-Tay type things, or Delulu for AI. So it's, it's great having teenage kids, I get new words all the time kind of thing. So in both cases, we're seeing a lot of hype, basically. So that, that, that's a lot of the premise that um, I'm going to be sort of talking about and things. Um, so what is driving this hype? I think in, in both cases, FOMO, fear of missing out. Um, particularly in my case, buying the sodding tickets, I'll tell you, <laughs> that was fear of missing out. Um, but that's a different uh, a story. But what are they missing out on exactly? So we've all used generative AI. Doing presentations like this should be really, really easy in this day and age. Um, I need some kind of a gimmick to help me through. Um, like a hook or a bridge or a chorus, that kind of thing. So you'll see what my gimmick is, obviously. Um, but um, yeah, so obviously my first port of call was generative AI, ChatGPT, can you help me out? And this is, this is very stereotypical of the kind of thing that you get with ChatGPT. Thanks, so what word meaning value contains the letters AI? Merit. Merit contains AI, and together means value or worth. So, yeah, that's where this is stemming from. In many ways, though, this, this isn't actually as bad as, I mean, just being plain wrong, authoritatively wrong, than kind of co-pilots, which are my pet hate at the moment. So with a few words, I, you know, PowerPoint can now generate this entire presentation for me, basically. And it's, at best, Gener generative? It's generic. Generic AI. It's plain. And, you know, if you thought death by PowerPoint used to be bad, having auto-generated <laughs> vacuous content um, is, is going to be terrible. So, you all have seen this kind of thing. Where are we on this hype cycle? Um, this is last year's hype cycle. I don't think Gartner have actually dared publish one yet because of all of the hype surrounding it. They're not really sure if it's going to be continuing or if we're in the on the end downward spiral to the trough of disillusionment. So another tech-fueled hype curve. You're, you're going to get bored of these, I know, I can tell. <laughs> okay. But um, undoubtedly, I, I, I mean, I've never seen a, a hype cycle like it, um, but I do get the feeling now in my little closed box of the kinds of things that I read, there is more discontent with it, basically. I mean, generative AI specifically, which is now synonymous with artificial intelligence across the piece, although I hate that idea. So who has actually done well out of this in terms of organizations and business and things? Really, at the moment, there's only one absolute clear winner by a street. So the question we want to be asking ourselves is, what are our spades? <laughs> it is a word. <laughs> okay. Um, more importantly, how do we get value for the customer? <laughs> so, um, I came across this quote by Bill Gates. Actually, only last week I came across the quote, but it, it kind of... Um, I don't know, it seems very appropriate. So we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. So don't let yourself be lulled into inaction, basically. So yeah, we know this is a hype curve. We know that 
um, even though it's been around for at least two years in terms of its generative AI, you know, uh, GPT-3 release and things, um, we still can't ignore it. So we can poo-poo it, we can, you know, I take the... Is it going to disappear? That's, that's the, like the real question. And kind of is the answer. That, that's my prediction as well, as this bloke that I stole the title from. But what do we mean by disappearing? So the rise of invisible AI, a phenomenon where AI seamlessly integrates into the background, quietly enhancing our experiences without drawing explicit attention. Um, Apple have been doing this forever. You know, they're really good at introducing new technologies, face recognition, all that kind of stuff. Um, but even then, they, they've had FOMO recently with their like, uh, announcements last week. Uh, they are going to be partnering with ChatGPT. And that can only be FOMO because they've, they've got access to all kinds of super large models and things um, in the background. So um, another thing that's, um, I, I guess, kind of like an implementation of this uh, invisible AI is this concept of Turing bots. So we didn't have a word for it until a few weeks ago when we were... Um, uh, talking to Forrester basically about what our ambitions and things are and they've come up with this concept of um, a label they didn't come up with the concept we certainly had that a long time before they did but they're calling them Turing bots so this is like the enhancement of invisible AI into um, platforms particularly and into pipelines that, that kind of thing so I don't know. I, yeah, I mean, it's you know, Alan Turing, but it's got nothing to do with it. It's just, it's just a label. I imagine it's actually a marketing term, and they went down the whole list, and that's trademark, that's trademark, that's trademark. We'll take that one, basically. So this is the moment when I'm going to do the surprise song. If you actually know the era's tour and things, I'm going to go solo, try and do a demo. So that will go, hopefully. <sighs> Right, it's not that way, not that way. All right, I just have to uh, mirror. So, this was alluded to before. Um, this is more of a, like a, a concept proof of work of like the idea of what we now calling Turing bots and things of AI working seamlessly in the background and things. And even this has undergone multiple iterations. Um, the idea here is that we are going to be deploying it at one of our clients. And there's a, a very different version that we've, we've got there, more advanced even. But this is the one that obviously I can sort of show externally and things. Um, but the idea here is to automate a business process workflow. So um, in this particular client, um, any kind of change that comes in, um, goes through JIRA and there's a triage process. There's various stages where you have a BA that will look at it, there's a solution architect will look at it. But the kind of change that comes through um, is usually not very well defined, not very well described, can be confusing, um, all of these kinds of things. And like the end-to-end -end, uh, process of being able to take a ticket through to the initial response back to the client is um, a horrendous amount of days, 40 days sometimes. So that that's the process that we're trying to um, help out here. So I'm going to actually, I'll, I won't do that. I'm going to cheat massively because of time. So I'm going to steal some of the text from a previous one. But the kinds of things we're going to see, uh, uh, I'll just do half of it initially. So create a new ticket. And this is to add a new feed to DFD. What the hell is DFD? We don't know. And then a bunch of text about what we want that to actually do. Um, all right. So we've created the ticket and then this is where we're putting it into our triage state and this is where the Turing bot kicks in in the background and processes the ticket. Um, this version is just using prompt engineering. We, we've got the persona of a BA in the background. The, the first um, iterations of it, we were using the full Autogen framework. And as Adam was saying, it's, it's kind of cool, but it was also very frustrating, very frustrating. Um, this one, we're more focused on um, 
the specifics uh, of and uh, trying to make it a bit more deterministic. So rather than having a group of different agents working together, this one is the specific role of a, of a BA. So that's been rejected with various different sort of comments added to it. Um, so it needs m more information, basically. Um, so I'm just going to cut and paste more information. So this is uh, specifically around sort of data security and things like um, all of the acronyms defined. We'll go in and add that extra layer. Can't see the save button. Right. And then put it back into triage again. So hopefully at this point, there's enough information in there for it to get past at least the first stage um, of our process. Get notification. Yep, and it's moved it into the next stage. So just to really show off, we've actually got two stages. Um, so here we should have now a, a full um, breakdown of the requirements that um, has been gathered kind of thing. We've got a summary from the ticket and also it's usefully pulled out all of the acronyms that it knows about. We can begin doing things like putting those acronyms in context. We could have a RAG data store in the background uh, is the kinds of stuff that we're doing. Um, so I'm now moving into the second stage of this workflow process, which is more the solution architecture stage. So having been given a list of requirements and things, we're now going to use our very finely tuned solution architect bot um, to analyze the requirements and come up with prospective solution based on um, constraints that that architect bot has to work within. I'm always nervous at this stage because occasionally this is the one where <laughs> part of the elements is to actually it um, generates a solution description which is written and then it generates some code to generate a solution design picture. Wow. So I'm going to show you one that's worked previously and we'll come back to why that one didn't work because it's a live demo, obviously. But th this is the kind of thing that we can expect. So not just like a, um, some kind of like stable diffusion uh, type image process. This is generating code, which then generates the, uh, the image. I'll give it one more chance. It is, yeah, indeed, indeed, indeed. Yeah. It's probably more likely I've just run out of bloody credits because I've been trying all day. <laughs> Make sure it works. All right, I ain't gonna, I'm not gonna dwell on that. I've seen it work many times. That's Gen AI for you, isn't it? <laughs> all right, let me switch back to this oh, box it's worked <laughs> <laughs> literally literally just no, no, I don't want to extend this play well, uh, it, it's usually just me being um, Okay. Yeah, it's this right this one down here. So this is this is the one that we were working on. So now we should have a nice solution design, which it has done. And because I did it twice, it's now got two diagrams added, so we can choose which is the better one, basically. But we won't dwell too much on, on that. Anyway. No, that, that, I mean, that, that, the stuff that we're doing now does generate the same diagram every time for, for one very specific reason. But this was still very much in the prompt engineering days, the kind of like we're generating code, it could be a little bit random, it's non-deterministic exactly what that diagram looks like, basically. It's 
stop mirroring. Okay, so this idea of, of, of Turing bots, invisible um, AI. I hope you can see it. There is a certain amount of merit in there. So ChatGPT was right all along. Um, a more important, um, I guess, sort of point for discussion is that this is about detail. It, it really is like the kind of the opposite end of the generic um, AI uh, side of things. The kinds of things that we're doing now is treating these as tools um, rather than a complete AI solution that's going to replace your business architect or your uh, business analyst even. Um, I think that things like the, uh, the RAG approach have introduced um, the idea of vector databases, but I don't think we fully understand the magic that vector databases themselves will be able to do. So just being able to... Um, add documents into a vector store and, and and the critical thing to get across is that if you've got the same input and the same model then the vector generated each time is identical now that's something you don't get with the whole llm side of things but the vectors are identical but you can start doing metrics you can start managing um the, the way things that are held within you know the information that has got latent knowledge because of the vectors and things so a lot of the work that we're doing is to find the nearest document but actually most of the business processes is to try and find bits of things that are missing. So you can do cosine similarity search, but find all of the stuff that you expect to be there, but isn't that, you know, that, that, that kind of thing. Um, so another thing that Gen AI is accused of a lot is um, the massive costs and cost in terms of money, in terms of environment, in terms of electricity and all that kind of thing. Um, so, we don't have full answers on this, but two things that um, I just want to mention that we are doing as a year. Um, we're working with a company called Heater, that is a cloud compute um, company. And what they do is put servers into people's houses. So data centers generate a lot of heat. That heat is very difficult to move anywhere. So move the data center to where the heat's needed. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a tiny operation, but it's a really cool idea. So they've done a lot in the Bitcoin mining side of things, and we're working with them to use their GPU capacity to fine-tune models. So the things that Adam was talking about, is uh, my particular passion at the moment, is the knowledge distillation from large models, fine-tune them down into much smaller models, and those smaller models can then be run on CPU, basically. And so you embed more and more of these smaller, dedicated models for specific business tasks and things. So back to the big question. Anyway, other things that could have mentioned about AI and Taylor Swift are things like deep fakes, for instance. Um, so instead of just uh, sustainable AI, responsible AI, and uh, so she was subject to a lot of vile activity at the beginning of this year, um, but she's one of the few people on earth that can actually take a stand against it. So within 24 hours of all of the deep fake images being put out on platforms, you had Sayan Nadala, I can't say her name, Microsoft CEO and Sam Altman immediately um, putting out statements that their platforms were not used. There was a presidential statement issued on it. There's been congressional meetings. And I, it wasn't directly related to the fact that there's now EU and US acts of um, sort of legislation and things, but that, that kind of like sort of power um, is you know is really important um i think regulation is a, is a double-edged sword as well though i mean obviously you need to be able to curtail the, the worst forms of it but there is a question as to whether the regulations that are going to be put in place are actually favoring larger companies and models and so therefore the the smaller um side of being able to train models and things may may be a problem anyway so what's my tay tay takeaway okay if i'm going to pull something together from all of this um, it's not artificial intelligence, it's emotional intelligence. So what, one of the things that Taylor Swift has got in buckets is that she's very relatable to a very large section of the, of the entire planet's population, never mind um, people. And um, she does this in, in a number of ways, but uh, mostly it's empathy and emotional intelligence are, are, are the critical things that she oozes, basically. 
And so 90% of uh, her show is a very well oiled, like Hollywood production. Um, but there's plenty of room left for customization and personalization and localization in every show. You know, she makes sure that she is really um, hitting the notes with like the, the local crowd, as it were. So in a very tenuous link, you know, we have this deep expertise. We do know about AI, some people specifically, <laughs> but um, we also have the empathy to understand like the customers and, and the scenario that they're in at the moment, this fear of missing out. So being able to um, be brave enough to call a spade a spade, however it's spelled. Um, but the main takeaway is that like each of the era's shows, our deliveries are tailored. <laughs> All right. That was it. Bit different, but...